The Week in Doubt, Episode 286. Hey everyone, I'm Phil Albertelli, the host of The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. Before we start, I'd like to thank Carly Van Nykirk for liking The Week in Doubt Facebook page. Is it Kirk or Nykirk? I'll throw both pronunciations out there and hope uh, one of them is right. My apologies, Carly, if I butchered your name. Thank you very much for liking the Weekend Out Facebook page. Also, I'd like to thank Vanessa Lowe for becoming a Patreon supporter. I already thanked her on the most recent episode of the Patreon bonus show, but I wanted to thank her publicly as well. Thank you, Vanessa. Much appreciated. All right, so my goal was to publish that belated Valentine's documentary this week, but then I found myself listening to David Pakman on the way to work, and he did a segment on Jordan Peterson. And against my better judgment, I thought to myself, I have to cover this. And I say against my better judgment because Jordan Peterson is obviously controversial. And although I don't think I'm all that tough on him, still you have to be kind of a a little masochistic to criticize him online. Because you know you'll catch some amount of backlash. And it's funny, I forget precisely why, but I recently went to my video manager on YouTube... And I noticed that all of the videos that mention Jordan Peterson in the title are demonetized or deemed, you know, not advertiser friendly or not suitable for all advertisers, however they word it. And I was thinking, wow, you know you're controversial when the mere mention of your name renders videos demonetized. I guess when I upload this episode to YouTube, I'm going to have to utilize some kind of anagram. Porton Jeterson, perhaps, or something to that effect. Uh, But I wonder when YouTube started that. Was it before or after that controversial Vice interview? It would be interesting to find out. But anyway, so the clip David Pakman is going to discuss is from a recent live conversation Jordan Peterson had with Matt Dillahunty from The Atheist Experience. I believe Matt was doing a tour and happened to be in Toronto and arranged this kind of last-minute get-together with Peterson. I was tempted to cover their exchange on the show, but I think I just found myself feeling exhausted and uninspired after watching it. I've seen so many theists, albeit I think Peterson is an odd kind of quote-unquote theist, versus atheist debates that I'm feeling kind of burnt out, to be honest. It seems like no new ground is ever broken. The theists always dig their heels in, no matter how weak their arguments are. And the whole thing usually just devolves into a circular pissing match. Unfortunately, I think the one person who always made such debates compelling to watch is now deceased, the late, great Christopher Hitchens. But when I was listening to the David Pakman episode in question, I really liked the clip he chose to comment on, and it got the wheels turning in my head and inspired me to want to comment. And I should briefly mention that I actually uploaded an excerpt from that Dillahunty Peterson debate or conversation to the Weekend Out YouTube channel as kind of a joke. No attempt to monetize it or anything. It was just for kicks. Uh, I did sincerely find the subject matter interesting, though. Dillahunty and Peterson um, talk about the nature of psychedelic experiences for at least seven minutes or so, and I irreverently entitled it something like Jordan Peterson and Matt Dillahunty talk about tripping on mushrooms, which in actuality really isn't too far from the truth. All right, but to make this episode more YouTube-friendly and to save myself some work, I'm going to be using a screen capture tool since I'll probably be stopping and starting this video a lot. So let's begin. I've talked off and on about Jordan Peterson, who's quickly become known as a sort of stunning and innovative intellectual by pseudo-intellectuals and anti-intellectuals and anti-SJWs. And I've basically characterized Jordan Peterson as an anti-SJW self-help equivalent to Deepak Chopra with a hidden twist of a Christian agenda. And I'm not going to recreate my entire criticism of Peterson's rhetoric here. That's really interesting. So he characterizes Peterson as a kind of self-help guru, kind of draws a comparison between Peterson and Deepak Chopra, and then says with a kind of hidden Christian twist. And I actually understand the hidden Christian twist thing. And I think that's what has always frustrated me about Peterson. And I've actually praised Peterson a lot in the past, talking about how I enjoy his lectures on psychology and 
religious and mythic symbolism, etc. Um, but as a non-believer, I do get kind of frustrated by this kind of airy-fairy approach he takes to religion and how he tap dances around whether or not brass tacks at the end of the day he believes in a literal god like a patriarchal creator deity that actually brought everything into being uh does he actually believe in the afterlife not in some figure of sense that we live on in the memories of our loved ones or something but is there more than just rotting in the earth does the ego self the the individual self actually survive the death of the brain the death of the body or is it uh, all the worms crawl in the worms crawl out worms play pinochle on your snout um lights out and all that and uh I actually do really find him to be a, a really interesting guy. And I know a lot of my listeners just cannot stand Peterson. But you know, I myself, I wouldn't characterize him as a charlatan. Uh, I understand how frustrated people get with him and their criticisms of him. But I do think he's sincere in a way. And I do think he's a genuine deep thinker. And does have his own kind of unique approach to things. Like I was joking around in the intro to this episode about how he was talking about psychedelics with Matt Dillahunty. And here's another area where I disagree with him. They were arguing over the point, you know, can psychedelics be used as evidence of actual transcendent spiritual experiences? And... Peterson was using psychedelics, like taking mushrooms, as evidence of a kind of metaphysical or transcendent realm, or as existence of the transcendent or the metaphysical, you know? Well, Dill Hunty's take was more in keeping with my own worldview, that I think we do, or we can, have these very deep and profound experiences on psychedelic drugs and even through other things just through being out in nature and losing that sense of ego and the beauty of nature uh losing oneself in art or feeling like you're in the zone feeling swept up by artistic or poetic inspiration um there's lots of different ways where we can feel that we've entered this kind of higher state of consciousness or where we feel kind of plugged into the universe or feel one with something bigger than ourselves or experience this kind of ego death. But to me, that those experiences in and of themselves, no matter how rich and beneficial they may be, are not definitive proof of a spiritual realm and I remember one time uh, Christopher Hitchens was debating, oh, what's that guy's name? I think his first name is Doug. Uh, their debate and their relationship was the subject of that documentary movie, Collision, I think it was called. But Christopher Hitchens would talk about the validity of the transcendent. And I remember one time his interlocutor there, you know, his opponent, said kind of dismissively, will transcend what? You know, you don't believe in a spirit or a spiritual realm, so what? You hit your head on the ceiling. You're not transcending anything. And to me, you know, it's it's pretty simple. To me, I think it's transcending one mode of consciousness to another, and that these experiences could be rooted in brain chemistry or neurobiology. Uh, we don't need to go to the supernatural to try to explain these powerful subjective experiences we sometimes have, whether they be through illicit drugs, meditation, uh, you know, the heights of orgasm, um, or uh, being intoxicated by nature, you know, um, or even, you know, the, the runner's high or that feeling athletes get when they're in the quote-unquote zone, when your head is probably, you know, flooded with endorphins. Uh, we know there's a direct correlation between 
brain chemistry and consciousness. We know that if you ingest anything from caffeine to LSD, you can significantly alter your state of mind. And just the mere fact that it's the ingesting of lysergic acid of this chemical compound that triggers this change in consciousness, that right there should tell you that there's a physiological, that there's a chemical cause and effect going on. And I guess to play devil's advocate in fairness to Peterson, you could say, well, maybe this very real chemical reaction or or mechanism allows for the spiritual experience. I remember how, you know, often I talk about Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception slash Heaven and Hell on the show, and how it had a, a very powerful effect on me as a young person. And one of the theories in that book, because it's all about the effect of drugs, of psychedelics on consciousness. Well, for the most part, it also gets into things like other mediums, uh, other vehicles for transforming consciousness, such as uh, strobe lights and meditation, you know, altering breathing patterns, etc. But Huxley talked about this idea of a consciousness reducer valve that he believed or seemed to believe that there was this eternal kind of mind at large, this universal collective consciousness that existed beyond the physical, and that our brains acted as kind of receivers to let that consciousness in. And because we need to be kind of practical utilitarian beings to survive from one day to the next, we can't afford to always be drunk on this experience of universal oneness. But if we take certain substances, those kind of turn the the key or crank open the valve and allow more of that universal consciousness to come in. And, you know, it kind of temporarily blows your mind and lets you commune with the universe or whatever, you know? So maybe, I'm very skeptical, as much as I loved and still love that book, I'm very skeptical that this is a reality. I can't disprove it definitively, but my guess is consciousness is an emergent property of the brain and that when the brain dies, we die. The individual self is extinguished when the brain, upon brain death. Um, It's not necessarily something I want to be true, but it, it seems the, the most logical assumption, I, I think. But I think what Jordan Peterson is doing is he's taking that kind of Huxleyan approach that, yes, the chemical reactions caused by ingesting or imbibing substances are quite real, but they act as kind of a key and a lock that allows for this spiritual, what he would probably see as a valid, authentic spiritual experience to take place. Now, does he believe that there really is a genuine spiritual realm that transcends the physical? Or is this him using figurative language to discuss subjective conscious experience, which takes place within the meat brain? I don't know. And that's one of the things that frustrates me about him. It can be hard to nail him down on that. It's like trying to nail Jello to a wall, and he seems to be quite kind of evasive or elusive. Um, But in other ways, I think he's very intellectually honest. He'll expound at length, very passionately, about his own ideas. But there's these little important areas where he doesn't want to give a a precise answer to. Like, uh, is is there an actual transcendent realm? Uh, Is there not a figure of God, as in... He talks about God being your highest ideal that you utilize in your life and that maybe undergirds your worldview. But that's not much of a God to me. That's not God in the sense of something that uh, brought the universe into being um, 13 point something billion years ago. Or is it 15 point something, you know? Yeah, so I just looked it up. 13.82 billion years ago. You could figuratively call anything that you place great importance upon and, and that you focus on or that undergirds your life as 
you're God. You know, some people talk about how, you know, people on Wall Street or whatever, their, their God might be money. Uh, other people's God might be sex, you know, something like that. There's a big difference between using God in that figurative sense and God as a sentient, self-aware, celestial being that chose to bring the physical universe into being 13.82 billion years ago and that still, you know, watches over us and <laughs> judges us or whatever. Um, a, a big difference between that and a figure of use of God, and even if you want to get more air, airy-fairy with your definition of God and say more of like a pantheistic view, maybe God as nature, God as some impersonal universal force like the force in Star Wars, there's still a big difference between even that and figuratively referring to your highest ideals as God. But I'm talking too much, so let's continue. But the long and short of it is that he became known for misstating what Canada's C-16 bill would have done with regard to transgender pronouns. He used that notoriety to publicly promote his, again, Deepak Chopra-like teachings, which if you want to critique, you're... Okay, so when it comes to that Canadian bill that had to do with pronouns and gender identity or whatever. I, I don't know what the story is. I'm just being honest. I don't know if Peterson mischaracterized it or not. To be honest, for the most part, I couldn't give a rat's ass about the whole SJW versus anti-SJW thing. I have my issues with uh, political correctness, but that whole thing isn't really what lights my fire. I get off on talking about religion, about talking about the big existential questions, that type of thing. Um, so when I first thought that Peterson was all about that stuff, the whole pronoun anti-SJW stuff, I really f thought, oh, here's some other anti-SJW guy on YouTube. How incredibly boring. And I didn't give a, a rat's ass about the guy. He didn't interest me in the slightest. It wasn't until I stumbled upon one of his lectures where he goes into depth about psychology and Jungian archetypes and uh, religious symbolism that I was like, wow, now this guy's kind of barking up my tree, you know? Uh, now he's kind of reminding me of this Joseph Campbell kind of figure and, uh, wow, you know, fascinating. I, re I really like what this guy's talking about. And um, so that's how I got interested in Jordan Peterson. And to be honest, then he kind of lost me again with the controversial Vice interview where he's kind of going into whether or not women should wear makeup in the workplace. And I believe in the existence of sexual cues. And I'm fascinated by the evolution of human sexuality, et cetera, and uh, the evolution of human sexual attraction. Um, so I do think sexual cues are very real. And I do think that makeup does act as a kind of sexual cue or does magnify female sexual attractiveness. And I think this is something that's been a part of human tradition and custom for a very long time. And as I said, it might have been during a Patreon bonus episode, that I don't think women wear makeup maliciously. I don't think that they go out of house thinking that, you know, I'm wearing this stuff so I can wrap the boss man around my finger or so that um, I can have guys on the street salivating after me or or longing for me. Um, I do think that there can be some, I mean, it's, it, it varies from individual to individual. Uh, I'm sure there are general reasons why I think women wear makeup. I know this is controversial stuff I'm talking about. I'm trying not to dig a hole for myself. I think, yeah, if a girl is single and going on, going out on a night on the town with her friends and she's hoping to meet a guy, she might hope that the wearing of makeup and the wearing of certain clothes might make her more attractive to prospective mates. Uh, and there may be, because some individuals are more manip manipulative than others, whether they be male or female, there may be certain females who maybe hope that dolling themselves up 
is going to make them more capable of getting what they want from the opposite sex or whatever. That's a possibility. But I also think many women dress a certain way or wear makeup because it's just tradition. It's custom. It's what they've seen growing up. And it's what they've been taught to see as what's expected of them. Um, And I think there's parallels in fairness with men too, right? Men wear power suits. Men wear things that make their shoulders look broader and their waist look slimmer. Things that magnify those male sexual cues that women find attractive. Um, And it's been customary for women in, say, like a white-collar workplace to wear makeup and a a business suit. Sometimes the business suit might even replicate aspects of male sexual cues, like, you know, the the wide shoulders and some, some things like that. Yeah, but I think a lot of women, you know, whether they're going to something as serious and formal as a funeral, whether they're going into the workplace, or whether they're um, going to a wedding or whatever, they'll wear makeup and uh, maybe heels or whatever, these things that, yeah, you could technically say heighten sexual attractiveness or heighten those those uh, sexual cues. Not because they're trying to look like some vamp or seductress, but because it seems to be, you know, that's what our culture expects of them. That's what's come to be considered the norm, you know? And uh, having a lot of female friends myself, I know that even girls will often say that they kind of get dolled up or spend so much time in their hair or choosing the right uh, ensemble or, or whatever out of the closet because they want to feel good about themselves and because they want to look presentable to their peers, to other women. So although I do think there is validity to the whole thing about makeup and dress and hair heightening these kind of sexual cues and heightening female attractiveness, I think Peterson puts too much emphasis on that stuff. And I think he even came off as sounding a little bitter in that Vice interview. And so, to be honest, he kind of lost me a little in that Vice interview. And uh, like I said, I really couldn't give a rat's ass about the uh, about the whole SJW versus anti-SJW thing. And I'm guessing that you'll probably uh, listen to this episode at some point or maybe even watch the YouTube version. Um, but my, my friend, uh, friend and listener Jody Mack actually made the point as, you know, a woman herself that, yeah, when, you know, she puts on makeup or does her hair or whatever, it's, you know, for herself and her own self-esteem and that men shouldn't take it for granted that when women, I keep on using the term doll, doll themselves up, just kind of an anachronistic term or archaic term. I, I don't know why that keeps popping into my head. Um, that they're not doing it for every guy on the street. It might even be for a specific guy, or it might be for no guy at all. It might be for themselves, or so they feel like, you know, they're keeping up with their peers or whatever. And, uh, what was the other thing? Yeah, so, Pacman keeps drawing a parallel between Peterson and Deepak Chopra. And as a skeptic, as a non-believer, an agnostic atheist, whatever, you can probably guess what I think of Deepak Chopra, Ironically, when I was a young seeker, I actually dug Deepak Chopra for a while, and I can even remember carrying around Deepak Chopra's book, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, around with me uh, when I was uh, in my teens, and telling my bandmates, embarrassingly, uh, you know, it makes me cringe now in retrospect, telling my bandmates how, you know, utilizing these principles might help us make it as a band and everything, you know? And I can remember I first learned about Deepak Chopra from PBS. And there's also, what what's his name? Is it uh, Dwayne Dyer? Is he the other guy? This kind of self-help guru that used to be on PBS. And it's weird because I think we, we tend to want to think of PBS as providing educational viewing material. And it's kind of, you know, it's funny thinking back on it, how I first learned about Deepak Chopra from PBS. And to be honest, I don't know how much Deepak Chopra buys into his own bullshit. This is just my my own intuition or the feeling I get. I tend to think that Peterson is more genuine than Deepak Chopra is, for whatever that's worth. Um, I, I don't personally think that Peterson is as much of a charlatan as as, as Chopra. 
I do think that sometimes Peterson might be a little clever or crafty when it comes to what things he chooses to dance around. But I do think that he's a passionate guy who actually does believe in the lion's share of what he preaches. And my take is he used to be someone with an atheistic and scientific materialistic worldview. Uh, That's what he claims. And I actually think that he had a kind of road to Damascus moment where he underwent a conversion, where he suddenly realized the power of embracing a more figurative slash spiritual approach to existence. How how powerful that can be in a person's life. How uplifting and transformational that can be. And I think that, you know, as someone who, and I'm speaking about Peterson, although I've had my own struggles with depression, um, and I too, like Peterson, am currently on antidepressants. I think for someone like himself, he says he struggles with depression. He comes from a family with a history of depression. I think that thinking figuratively helped to save him personally. That's my take on it. And I'm not trying to be overly presumptuous. That's from listening to him talk about his own kind of transformational experience in life, going from being an atheist to this person with a more figurative and elastic worldview. That's the feeling I get. And I almost feel like maybe he almost acts as a kind of evangelist for this worldview in a way. And he he sees himself as kind of proselytizing for his own gospel, his own good news, which for him is that you don't need to have a scientific materialistic view to get by in the world, that you don't need to interpret religion literally to embrace a spiritual worldview. And that's what he's proselytizing. That's, that's his thing. And me, as an, as an agnostic atheist, as a skeptic, as someone who I think has a kind of poetic, maybe even spiritual worldview in their own way, but at the end of the day still believes in hardcore science and who still has a worldview that has a kind of scientific underpinning, I choose not to go that far. I still believe in a more embracing a more scientific worldview. Not because it's what I think is more comfortable. No, actually, quite the contrary. This is a worldview that was hard won for me that came from undergoing a lot of my own dark nights of the soul and experiencing my own very painful loss of faith. And it was through wanting to know the truth and through pursuing empirical truth and reason that I came to my own atheistic worldview. And I only call myself an agnostic atheist because I believe at the end of the day, you can't definitively or empirically prove whether there is or isn't a God or an afterlife. But I think due to the lack of evidence, things seem to lean towards the side that most likely there is not a personal God or an afterlife. And that's not what I want to be true. That just seems to be where my reason leads me. Um, So this is where I differ from Jordan Peterson. But uh, let's continue. You're either misstating Peterson's statements or you just don't understand what Peterson is saying. And he's grown this massive income for himself on the basis of appealing to this anti-SJW crowd. So what I want to do today is look at a specific video that was posted on our subreddit. Okay, hopefully I'm not irritating you guys by how much I'm pausing. But, and hopefully you couldn't hear me gulping uh, Hawaiian punch, Hawaiian punch on ice. It's the daytime, I'm not drinking yet. And Pacman mentioned Peterson's income. And I think Pacman's uh, off-camera sidekick here might bring this up in a bit too. And I, I've mentioned this on the show before, perhaps uh, on one of the Patreon bonus episodes, that before pa- before uh, Peterson rather made his monthly Patreon income private, before he set it to private, 
He was earning about $60,000 a month just from Patreon. That Patreon income is separate from what he makes off of his books, what he makes off of his online self-authorship courses and that kind of thing. Um, And I just want to state up front that just because someone makes a lot of money off of something, that doesn't automatically negate the validity of what they have to say. Um, the two aren't mutually exclusive. You can earn a handsome income while espousing teachings that have some validity, too. Earning a lot of money doesn't automatically make you a charlatan, so I'll say that in Peterson's defense. But as someone who's a podcaster, who's an internet content creator, I would be lying if I said I wasn't jealous I make about I make under fifty dollars a month on Patreon. I make maybe a hundred to a hundred and fifty bucks every couple of months if I'm lucky off of YouTube. And um, you know, I'm a freelance designer. I have a degree in graphic design, but my day job is still swinging a hammer with my family. You know, working construction. And I come from an old school family who believes, blood or not, you get paid what you deserve. So I really don't make a lot of money. Um, And the little bit of money I do earn through my passion, this podcast, one of my passions, I have other artistic passions or creative passions as well. Um, But this podcast is primarily, this is my biggest passion in life right now. And the mo- the little bit of money I make off of this podcast sometimes helps me to squeak by. So I'd be lying my ass off if I was to say that, or arse, for my friends across the pond, if I was to say that, hearing that this guy makes $60,000 a month for basically espousing his worldview, that that didn't make me jealous. It does. I I, I wish that was me. And to some degree, I chalk that up into the the sometimes life ain't fair column. There's an ocean of content creators out there, including myself, you know, who we do our best to be responsible, to be as truthful and honest as possible, and to create quality content. And what we do still remains a labor of love, and we don't even come close to being able to support ourselves doing what we love. And, uh, yeah, once again, you know, hey, tough luck, bucko, as Peterson might say. You know, sometimes life ain't fair. And, uh, so I think it's it's a combination of luck, and it's also a combination of talent, too. I don't want to take that away from him. Um, Peterson is an intelligent, well-spoken guy. And I think sometimes people experience this kind of convergence of factors, where they're saying the right thing at the right time, and being heard by the right demographic. And this all comes together to make them successful or famous or whatever. And uh, for most of us, that doesn't happen. But my plan as a content creator is to keep on pushing because I love what I do. I love the friends that I've made doing this podcast. I love the feedback I get from my, my listeners, many whom I now count among my friends. And I'm honored that I make the modest amount that I do off of doing this. And I have no plans to stop anytime soon just because I don't make a lot of money. But yeah, it, it does. It, it, it makes me jelly, man. Super peanut butter and jelly that there are people who earn that much off of Patreon. Absolutely blows my mind. But uh, let's continue. That goes to an example of the hidden Christian Christian agenda that many people just don't see or know about Jordan Peterson. He recently debated friend of the show Matt Dillahunty, who I've interviewed before. And at a certain point during the debate, Peterson makes the ridiculous claim, which is that even people who say they are atheists actually do believe in God deep down, maybe so deep down that they don't even know it, because if they were actually atheists, they wouldn't have a moral compass and might be mass murderers because you can't actually have that moral compass without accepting religion in some way. Maybe I'm misunderstanding or misstating what Peterson said. I'm sure his followers will say that. So let's take a look at the video. 
Yeah, I'm trying to, for years I had this thing going where people would say, oh, and this is kind of what we're getting at from a different angle. I would say they would be afraid of what we would lose if we lost religion. And I basically said, demonstrate to me any benefit. Oh, you'd lose that, art and poetry and drama and narrative why, and story. Why? Are, there, are there no godless artists and poets? Well, there are artists and poets who think they're godless. <laughs> Okay, so I think that ticked off or tickled his funny bone uh, in, a, in a kind of way, uh, David Pakman, and frankly, it pisses me off too. And I think it's very presumptuous of Peterson. But I will say I do understand the thought process behind it or, you know, the thinking behind it. And by understand it, I don't mean I approve of it or agree with it. By understand it, I mean just that. I understand the mechanics of it. I'm familiar with the thinking, with the quote-unquote logic that gets a person from point A to point B regarding that kind of assumption. So Peterson, I forget if they'll cover it in this clip, but this goes into his deficient, def, I almost said deficient, that would be a, quite a Freudian slip. This, this goes back to his definition of God. And that he seems to embrace a figurative or very fast and loose kind of definition of God, or maybe multiple definitions of God, but then embraces them as if they're real and speaks and acts accordingly. So he mentions in this conversation with Dill Hunty, as I think I mentioned earlier already, that to him, according to certain philosophers or psychologists, that, quote-unquote, God can be seen as being defined as what your highest ideal is that you act upon. So let's say you don't literally believe in a God, in some being that brought the universe into creation, and that you, like myself, think that religions are no more than man-made belief systems. Maybe, figuratively, they have something to offer in some areas, maybe not. But man-made, nevertheless, at the end of the day, that even if that's your outlook, even let's say you're a hard atheist, that if you still believe in morality, even if you believe that your morality, like me, that at least the roots or the capacity for morality are grounded in evolutionary biology, that we evolved to be a social species, and we can have this dual nature in, based on the whole in-group, out-group dynamic I think we're wired for both altruism, empathy, group cooperation, and tribalism and violence. We're a mixed bag. And I think that's basically what you see when you look at our species as a whole. You see beings that are quite capable of love and compassion and empathy. Uh, but you also see a species that, unfortunately, often displays this kind of in-group, out-group tribalism and uh, we're a species plagued with war and violence, too. Kind of exactly what you might expect to see if a social ape evolved to the point where it could take over the globe, you know? Um, and I have a strong moral code. I think that the basics of morality are rooted in evolutionary biology. That you can look at other mammalian species and probably even spe probably even insects you can see... Um, Examples of group solidarity and cooperation, such as ant colonies, etc. But you look at other mammalian species, you can see the strong maternal instinct. You can see how animals will often groom each other, share child-rearing responsibilities. How, even though it puts themselves at risk, how animals like certain monkeys and um, meerkats will often raise an alarm call even though it will draw the attention of a predator to themselves because it draws the attention away from the group at large. I mean, so we'll see these examples of animal altruism. Um, yeah, not trying to sugarcoat it. We'll also see examples of cannibalism and violence in the animal world too, just as we see those things, unfortunately, in the human world, and yes, we ourselves are animals, we're uh, mammals, we're great apes. So we do have this capacity for compassion and altruism and empathy. And I think we've evolved so much as a species and not even necessarily evolved just 
physically or biologically, but culturally and societally, we've evolved to a point we're almost, you know, as like a global community, we're so interconnected. Before, you know, we lived in small tribal bands. Now we're in touch with humans all over the world. And I think our empathy for others, we're now able to project on the global community, onto humans who are even not members of our immediate group, to humans on the other side of the world. If we see a video of a starving child or an innocent person being beaten, or not even within our own species, I'm one of those pers- I'm one of those people who often get more disturbed by seeing animals suffer than humans suffer. Take that for what it's worth. Um, some people will probably uh, feel a sense of solidarity with me because of that. They can relate to that. Some people will probably condemn me for that. But it's true. Maybe I'm so kind of inured to human on human violence because we we see so we see so much of it in the news, etc. Or that I have a complicated relationship with my own species. But yeah, often it, if I hear about a war on the other side of the world, I'll find it distressing, but not nearly as dispre- distressing as if I hear about someone throwing a live puppy out a window on the freeway. And that's just me being honest. Sorry if that upsets you. Um, but yeah, even if we see like a video of an animal suffering on the other side of the world, it can sometimes practically bring us to tears or fill us with outrage and and wanting to see justice done on that animal's behalf or whatever. And so I think that we do have these positive moral impulses that are ingrained, although I think they do have to be kind of honed and refined through nurture. So I think our morality is a combination of both nature and nurture. Uh, I'm not going to deny that. Um, And I do think there's a selfish aspect to being moral. I do think that it's good to have a social contract that if I don't want you to steal my stuff, if I don't want you to try to break in and kill my family, then I shouldn't steal your stuff. I shouldn't break in and try to kill your family. And if you're, and there have been people who do absolutely horrendous things throughout history. Some of it might be cultures where that impulse towards empathy is overridden, or where there's, you know, this kind of heavy in group over out group conditioning where people are conditioned to see people outside their group as fodder and the only people that should be valued or in are members of the in group look at the way the japanese treated the chinese during um world war ii or the treatment of the jews or other prisoners during the nazi holocaust during world war ii uh where prisoners were treated as less than human as less than as less than animal uh, the SS probably, it's safe to say, probably treated their dogs more humanely than they treated their um, their prisoners of war, especially their Jewish prisoners. Um, so that kind of inherent wiring for empathy and altruism, that can be overridden with the right social conditioning. But I think there's probably plenty of examples where that conditioning holds and we feel a sense of empathy even towards members of the L group. Examples where soldiers see the mistreatment of prisoners or of civilians by their own comrades, and they know this is not right, you know? And they either feel compelled to stop it, or maybe they don't act, and they just suffer internally with the guilt of seeing these kind of atrocities and not doing anything, you know? You know, it's like I said before, you could take a busy street corner in New York or some primitive village on the other side of the world, uh, I don't know, maybe somewhere in Papua New Guinea or something, and uh, in either place, despite whatever different cultural mores they might be, if we saw someone walk up, grab a baby out of a woman's arms and dash it on the ground, or punch an old woman in the face you know, for no reason, we would be shocked and horrified and, and appalled. And, and for the most part, that's probably for 
pick a culture of your choosing anywhere around the world. Although, like I said, people can be conditioned to commit the most heinous of atrocities. Yeah, and so like Matt Dillahunty, I consider myself to be a person with a strong moral compass, a person who, for lack of a better word, and maybe this is playing in the Peterson's hands, almost treats my own moral code as if it's sacred, you know? And where does that morality come from? I think it's partly, as I just finished explaining, partly evolutionary and partly conditioning, partly, you know, um, something that's been honed and refined through nurturing, through being brought up in a specific culture. And the end result is I'm a caring being, someone who would be horrified and appalled if I saw someone kill a child or an innocent animal or whatever. Um, someone I'd like to believe if I, if I was walking down the street and saw someone crying and looking towards me would be compelled to stop and say, what's wrong? But that doesn't mean that that moral code is religious in nature. I might treat it as quote unquote sacred for lack of a better word because of how important it is to me and how much it underpins my worldview, my, my approach to life. And if you want to, in the most figurative, airy-fairy terms possible, want to say that I do have my own religion in a way where I've talked about on the show how I almost have a religious zeal for the truth, which is what, you know a big part of why I have an atheistic worldview. Because since an early age... I have tended to want to choose knowing what's true over embracing what simply makes me feel good or what beliefs I might find comforting. I want to know, I feel like I almost have some kind of duty and obligation to try to find out what is empirically true and to gain as real and accurate as possible an understanding of this world that I inhabit. And you might say that my zeal in that respect, you know, the the importance I place on truth and morality, that in a sense, this does create the framework of, of, a, of a worldview. And those things are so important to me that they're almost, quote unquote, sacred values, for lack of a better term. But that doesn't mean that I act as if there's a creator God out there, or that I believe there's a creator God out there. And unfortunately, it doesn't mean that I really believe deep down that there's an afterlife. Uh, I've doubted the existence of an afterlife for a very long time now, and it's something that I had to grow accustomed to. And it was something that caused me a great amount of mental anguish. There was a time when I could imagine nothing more horrific than the thought that there may not be an afterlife. That when my loved ones, when myself, you know, when we die, that's it. Lights out. You're basically rotting meat in the earth, you know. That's a horrible thing to try to reconcile or to, to, to deal with. And yet I chose to not shy away from the fact that that seemed unfortunately to be the conclusion. And I have grown kind of a nerd to that concept over time. I'm more disturbed by the idea of my loved ones dying than I am of myself dying. The idea that I might not exist, uh, you know, one day, that uh, I don't find that so troubling anymore. Partly because, you know, just logically speaking, if there is no afterlife, I won't be aware that there isn't an afterlife, so it's not like I'll be in any kind of emotional distress going, oh no, there's no afterlife. And also just because I'm just, I think, too emotionally jaded, you know, having spent so much time worrying about that when I was younger and having have already gone through so much anguish wrestling with that, I just can't be bothered to care anymore. And there's another dimension or area of my life where, you know, as pretentious as it sounds, I consider myself an artist in a sense. Because for a long time, since I was a kid, I've had a passion for creating art, for writing poetry and song lyrics. And there's times when I experience artistic inspiration or where I get drunk on art or music, where I find I experience that kind of loss, that death of the ego self, when I get caught up by a certain powerful inspirational idea or moment of inspiration or whatever. And if you wanted to, you could probably call those 
quote unquote religious moments. It's almost like um, these moments of artistic inspiration for me are probably almost akin to another person's religious experience. Maybe like a Pentecostal snake handler or whatever that specific sect is that does the you know, the snake handling and the speaking in tongues or whatever. Um, but the difference is I'm ready to admit that those things could be rooted in brain chemistry or neurobiological phenomena. And, and it's not the fact that you that some outside spiritual force has to be breaking through that you're communing with. It could be not that you're transcending from the mundane realm to literally the divine, but that you're simply transcending from one mode of consciousness to another. I'm not saying I know with 100% certainty which it is, but from what we know about brain chemistry and neurology and the nature of the world we live in, I think the safe bet is to lean towards consciousness as an emergent property and that these are subjective experiences taking place inside the meat brain. That being said, I still absolutely love those experiences and I consider them to be a very important part of my life, and my life would be much duller without them. So, I mean, if Peterson reworded it, maybe if he said, all right, you're an artist who's also an atheist, but, you know, you may think you're an atheist, but you act as if God exists. I don't know if he intentionally words it in that kind of provocative, inflammatory way or what, but he could say, well, you're an atheist who acts like you're communing with the divine, at least. Now that I might be more receptive to. If you want to say, okay, when I feel enwrapped by a moment of artistic inspiration, or when I feel myself kind of melting into the beauty of nature or whatever, that yeah, in a sense, psychologically, emotionally, it does kind of feel like a religious experience. There is this feeling of transcendence. So yeah, you could say I act as if I'm communing with the divine. And th yeah, that's probably a fair way to put it. But when you say I act as if I believe in God or that God exists, I think that's provocative. And, and there's, it, it really depends on a number of things. I mean, what do you mean by God? Are we talking about nature as God, like some pantheistic thing? Um, are we talking about some impersonal sense of oneness, you know, like we find in Eastern religion or once again, the force in Star Wars? Or are we talking about God, the patriarchal Yahweh, this personal sentient being that chose to bring everything into creation and watches and judges us that one day we'll have to stand before? I don't think I'd necessarily act like that's true, you know? And I think you could go back to ancient, the ancient roots of religion, to shamanism, shamanism, tomato, tomato, to animism, to, you know, the basic animistic beliefs that there were spirits and trees and rivers and things like that. And uh, you would find people, in, in, you know, susceptible to these same kind of quote-unquote transcendent states. And I think sometimes the most powerful examples of quote-unquote spiritual states we can see are among primitive peoples. Shamanic trance, um, the kind of the spiritual ecstatic states that we see primitive people uh, in, animist, in animistic cultures and shamanic cultures enter into. And I actually find those very inspiring and moving to, to see. And I think it's because, in part, I can kind of relate to where those people are. Um, but you don't need to believe in a patriarchal creator God or to believe in a personal God to enjoy those states, you know? I think you can be a polytheist, uh, a pagan, um, yes, a monotheist, uh, an animist, uh, a pantheist, um, an atheist, or an agnostic. And still enjoy those moments of of uh, rapture, those moments of quote unquote transcendence, for lack of a better word. Once again, at the end of the day, there might simply be a neurobiological explanation, and it's just transcending one mode of consciousness into another. You know, I've had some really beautiful moments on ecstasy or on mushrooms, but I don't doubt that it was the chemistry that got me there. You know, um, but once again, I don't want to. <clears throat> 
go full circle by returning to what I was saying at the beginning of the episode. So let's continue. So <laughs> we might have crossed over into a problem area because yeah, no doubt. I, I don't actually, I can't draw for crap, although I do draw during the show. Um, but one of the individuals who came to the show the other night handed me something that she had spent a great deal of time drawing. She's a wonderful artist. I'm very grateful to get it. And, um, you know, while I pretend to read minds on stage, I, I constantly acknowledge that I can't actually read minds. So I can't tell you whether or not she actually believes in a God, but I can tell you that I actually don't believe in a God, and I could write poetry. But you act poetry. like you do. Huh? But you, you act like you do. That's why you didn't I want to throw like Sam off the stage. No, now you're making a claim. Okay, so I'm telling you I don't believe there's a God. And yeah. your, your response to that is, I really do, because I have a moral sense. But my moral sense is utterly without any appeal to a God. Explicitly. Or implicitly. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, maybe. The f That's not so obvious. Okay, it's really See, because it's, it's you, easy. Regard, you regard Sam Harris as an implicitly valuable entity. Because otherwise, you'd just throw him off the stage. And then the question is, well, just exactly why is he an implicitly valuable entity? I don't... Okay, so here Peterson, I think he's acting like this is this gotcha. Well, just why is he a valuable entity, you know? And uh, there's an ongoing joke throughout this conversation where both men have had arguments with Sam Harris. So there's this ongoing joke where they talk about um, throwing Sam Harris off of a stage and, you know, uh, what your moral sense would uh, say about that or whatever. And you can go back to, once again, the evolutionary biological roots of morality to, to figure out why Sam Harris is an inherently valuable being. The mere fact that we're members of a social species who have evolved to treat each other, at least sometimes, with some degree of respect and deference, and to recognize the worth of members of our own species, right? That's enough to explain why you don't throw Sam Harris off the stage. Just like chimpanzees will sometimes commit acts of cannibalism, murder, shall we call it, uh, infanticide even. But for the most part, a chimp will, will groom the chimp sitting next to it, not pick up a rock and bash it over and bash its face in or uh, use its teeth and claws to, to rip the other one's face and fingers off, even though that's what they are capable of doing in a fight. And that just brought to mind that awful case about the woman who got mauled by the uh, chimpanzee some years back. And of course, humans also, like I said before, also sometimes engage in things like infanticide, uh, murder and cannibalism, etc., um, yeah, but even social animals more often than not will choose to respect the life of members of their own in-group rather than just suddenly in a fit of, you know, chaos, you know, all turn on each other and, and gnaw each other to death. If that happened, you know, there wouldn't be any species left on the earth except for maybe, uh, some, uh, microorganisms or something respecting the life of of one's own members of one's own species enough that we leave enough of ourselves alive to procreate and perpetuate the species. That's probably an evolutionary thing, you know, <laughs> and um, that's an explanation enough why we don't just, you know, bury uh, an axe in our neighbor's head or um, push old, randomly push old people uh, downstairs or whatever, you know, uh, or why we don't throw Sam Harris off the stage. The metaphysics of that. I don't think he's implicitly. You don't need metaphysics sense. for it. In the <laughs> First and foremost, this is a hypothesis that is unfalsifiable, right? The idea that atheists believe in God so deep down that even they don't know it, you can't test that. And therefore, it is not of any effective value. What's saying, what he's saying effectively is that it might seem like you can be a good person and have a moral compass and not believe in God, but in reality, the reason you're a good person is because you believe in God, even if you don't know about it, and that's what prevents you from being a mass murderer or throwing Sam Harris off of a stage. How does this pass as intellectual thought, right? This is an example of the nonsense that he spews 
wrapped up in being against social justice warriors and transgender pronouns, and his audience just eats everything up because they like the anti-SJW stuff. And the, the underlying belief system and bias that's at play here is atheists are secretly religious. And that's a really common thing among true believers like Jordan Peterson, which is he can't really conceive of someone having a belief system so different than his. So actually, that's a great point that Pacman makes. That's really similar to that obnoxious attitude that a lot of um, that a lot of uh, Christians and members of other faiths believe that you may say you don't believe in God, yeah, but you really do. No, no. But, but like I said, for myself and a lot of other people like me who are raised religious, one of the toughest things we ever had to do was to, you know, go through the loss of our faith and, you know, to look the abyss in the eye and allow ourselves to honestly contemplate that there may not be a God or an afterlife. You know, if I really believed that there was a God, I never would have questioned. And that sincere questioning never would have led me to eventually become an atheist, agnostic atheist, whatever. And it reminds me of something I was thinking about this week, and hopefully my family's not listening. I've told this story on the show before, and I actually included it in that book I was working on. But you can find, uh, there's an episode of The Weekend Out where I read from that, uh, that unfinished book where I tell this anecdote. But I remember working a shitty retail job when I was in my late teens and coming home. And finding my mother crying at the, the table and asking her what's wrong. And she said that my grandmother, her mother, had died. And I w it was hard because even then I had this like emotional wall I could feel building up between myself and my family. And I was, you know, I was kind of angsty and had issues and shit. But I did what I thought was right and I pushed through all that. And I gave my mother a hug. And I remember, even though I didn't believe it, I thought it was the right thing, right thing to say. I told my mother, I said to my mother, well, at least she's in a better place now, you know? And, uh, you know, she's gone to heaven or whatever. I remember I could hear my mother through her tears, my Catholic mother with crosses on the wall with religious statues all over the dresser, you know? My mother, who would always say, if anyone asks, you're a Catholic, you know, and who always was very serious about the religion, her, say to me through her tears, I wish I could believe that. And so I think, you know, you can flip that around and you can just as easily say that people who believe may very well on some level not believe or have some, you know, some significant doubt buried down in there. And it might be part of why they get so defensive around atheists, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think Peterson seems a little too smug when he tries to come off as saying, you act like you believe in God or trying to imply that everyone, you know, believes in God in some way. Yeah, if you want to play psychology professor, which he is, you know, and uh, that's the kind of thing. He kind of like plays around with which hat he has on, you know? He's saying something a psychology professor would say, that figuratively or symbolically, it's as if you have a god, right? Your ideals, that's your god. But then he tries to sell that while kind of defending religion. So it comes off like he's, you know, no better than those believing Christians who do obnoxiously try to tell atheists that you, you may say you don't believe in God, but you really do. Uh, it's definitely one of the things that really irks me about Peterson. He finds an explanation that deep down they must believe in God because, yeah, he doesn't see them committing mass murder or throwing people off of stages. I don't know how any so-called non-religious skeptic type can follow Jordan Peterson and fall for his nonsense. And I don't get how the so-called free speech warriors fall for it either since his entire rise to fame was based on misstating an issue of free speech, that C-16 bill. But... I do want to congratulate Jordan Peterson, and I'm not doing this sarcastically, genuinely. He's laughing all the, all the way to the bank with this stuff. He oh, yeah. has built a fantastic business model on the basis of appealing to these individuals, and there is a ton to be learned from Jordan Peterson.
but it has nothing to be learned about his, uh, there's, it's not actually things to be learned from his teachings. It's about how you can wrap yourself up in this anti-SJW free speech stuff and have people accept you almost as a godlike figure and give you their money. Yeah, when his Patreon account numbers were public, he was making $60,000 per month. Yeah. I don't know where it's at now, but he also has uh, his new book. And oh, he's yeah. He's doing like the speaking tours. Sure. Very lucrative business model, that's for he sure. He really is similar to Deepak Chopra in that way as well, who also has a very, very lucrative business model. Uh, and so once again, I'll defend Peterson just a little that kind of implying that he's in it for the money if that's what David's doing in fairness, or that he's just in for the money, might be kind of, you know, might be rather unfair because even though I criticize Peterson for being intellectually dishonest in a sense, I don't even necessarily know how conscious it is on his part. And I do think that he is passionate and sincere for the most part concerning his beliefs. And if you look at his kind of rise to celebrity or whatever, um, I don't know if he was necessarily seeking out celebrity, you know, fame or popularity or whatever in the beginning. It seemed that he just happened to be expressing his views about the gender pronouns or whatever. The you know, that uh, all that, you know, the whatever anti SJW stuff. And I don't even like talking about it just because it's so divisive. And I, I personally just so uninterested in that uh, ongoing online conflict. But it seemed like he was sincerely expressing his beliefs about that crap, the pronouns or whatever. And people noticed, people like Sargon of Akkad, etc. And those people helped to very quickly make him popular online. And the whole thing just kind of rapidly snowballed or grew. And now you have uh, this pedestal with um, Jordan Peterson on it. Very strange. But yeah, I'm sure he ain't bitching about the 60000 a month. <laughs> Holy shit, man. If anyone feels like making me into the uh, the next god man, I, I certainly wouldn't turn down an extra sixty grand a month. Holy crap. Holy crap, indeed. I mentioned that earlier, but he's also similar to the preacher dudes that say, donate, 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 and then they buy themselves a private plane with the money. Not that Peterson is buying himself a private plane, but it's the idea of those guys who will sell you uh, a really well wrapped up package that makes you say, I'm going to give them the money. And then you don't even really know in the end what you're actually giving the money for. So uh, not surprising, but a lot of people unaware of the underlying sort of Christian dogma of Jordan Peterson. We'll take a break and I will talk. Yeah. So I don't know if I'd say that Peterson pushes Christian dogma, but I feel like he does act as a kind of defender of the faith. And I think he's even said before that he technically considers himself a Christian. Although if you try to ask him if he actually believes in Jesus, he'll say, well, that, that depends what you mean by Jesus, what you mean by Christ, what you mean by God, what you mean. I don't know if he says what you mean by believe, but it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't surprise me. Um, so, and, and I think he looks at Jesus as this kind of archetype. But I've never heard him say he actually believes that 2,000 years ago, um, a Jewish preacher <laughs> uh, in ancient Palestine rose from the, physically rose from the dead and strolled out of his tomb. You know what I mean? So he doesn't necessarily speak like an evangelical uh, preacher or anything, but I think he defends Christianity without necessarily mentioning Christianity much. I think he almost defends it by putting his airy-fairy definitions of God out there and by telling people that they're acting like they believe in God even if they say they don't. It's very strange. And before editing this, I'm well over an hour. This is unbelievable. I, I thought this episode would be like 20 or 25 minutes long. I don't even know if I'll get to edit this today. I'll probably uh, edit it tomorrow. But thanks for listening, guys. And as always, you know the drill. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. If you want to help the show out monetarily, you can give $60,000 to the Weekend Out podcast. I'm, I'm joking, but I won't say no. You can go to uh, patreon.com slash the Weekend Out and support the show for as little as 99 cents a month. Um. And uh, with that being said, all right, I guess it's a wrap. Uh, thanks, brothers and sisters. Until next time.